the Pyramid of Menkura, the smallest, yet by no means least interesting of the Great Pyramids of Giza, claimed to have been built by the Egyptian pharaoh Menkura some 4,000 years ago. The pyramid's origins, however, like the many other giant and perfectly carved structures and statues found throughout the Giza Plateau, no one seems to be able to explain how or why such figures within known, well-studied history accomplished such feats. With the entrance to the Chapel of the Cult exposing just how much of a challenge this construction would have been for our copper-welding ancestors some 4,000 years ago. Lined with megalithic sandstone blocks, with some well over 100 tons in weight, the remains of basalt casting stones strewn around their feet, either disturbed by invading parties or simply fallen from where they once stood, in front of the megalithic blocks, all now exposed to the elements, with additional styles from other, now lost civilizations littered all around the pyramid, indicative of its rediscovered importance by other now lost civilizations, who we feel clearly came and went since the pyramid's original constructions. This extraordinary section of the ruins are predictably rarely discussed or studied. We believe this due to the inexplicable nature of the surrounding ruins, in addition to further supporting claims that the casting stones found upon the pyramids are not only covering megalithic blocks of an even larger scale, but were a later addition, just like that of the unfinished polygonal masonry, making up additional casing stones around the entrance of the Menkura pyramid itself. Furthermore, Menkura also contains inner chambers, just like that of the world-famous Cheops. Yet rumors that only Cheops possess such tunnels persist to the modern day. And one wonders why. Why was Menkura clearly focused on by several different conservation efforts? Why is it the only pyramid with Peru-style polygonal casing stones? Who could have possibly built the entrance tunnel, or indeed the pyramids themselves? And why is the pyramid largely, and it would seem purposefully, overlooked? We find the possible motivations highly compelling. Many of you have seen the recent viral video of a paraglider flying dangerously close to the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza with his GoPro, with some astute people noting that this footage snapped hieroglyphics on the very top of the pyramid. Although many believe these sites be littered with hieroglyphs, the mainstream paradigm would have you believe that this is, in fact, a fallacy. There are no tombs, mummies, or indeed hieroglyphs to be found anywhere upon or inside the Great Pyramids. The question then is, what is this writing? Is it true hieroglyphs? And if so, what do they say? We do not condone the climbing or indeed vandalism or decisions to climb and possibly damage these astonishing and priceless relics. Yet the question remains, are these authentic? If so, why cover them up? Well, we may be able to explain why these hieroglyphs could indeed be covered up, and in addition, also back up the hypothesis that the Egyptians did not build the pyramids, but rather merely re-inhabited these astonishing ruins, adapting lost technologies discovered and unraveled within, subsequently using the pyramids to impress and intimidate their neighbors and convince the world they built them, not only then, but all the way into the modern era. Yet I digress. Along with this photograph of hieroglyphs corroborating the aforementioned hypothesis, we also have the array of photographs displaying casing stones, some detached, possibly due to past cataclysm, protecting stones often many hundreds of tons in weight that are clearly of a far greater age than that of what we feel are more modern yet still ancient conservation efforts we feel later undertaken on the pyramids themselves. Furthermore, in addition to the water controversy theory, which presents the evidence for Anubis Lake around what is now the Great Sphinx, the face of the Sphinx itself displays significant rain damage. Yet we feel the most compelling and supporting evidence for the pyramid's true age is the layers of salt sediment that were removed from lower chambers all over Giza during its re-excavation. This suggestive submersion would explain not only the extreme corrosion present on an older surface-level stonework, 
but the abrupt end of this very ancient civilization, who, we posit, were responsible for not only the Great Pyramids, but ruins all over the Earth. How could we have varying levels of casing stones, each of a different stone, and some even of a polygonal nature, yet the stone behind be far greater eroded? How could there be hieroglyphs beneath where there would have been a capstone, if these relics were not in the condition we see them today when re-inhabited? We find such questions, and indeed the hieroglyphs themselves, highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants. Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones, protecting inner megaliths, 
clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion, which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavall and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and to us, a mystery, which is incredibly compelling. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825. Yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself. Yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity, he simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms, lined along long corridors, running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage in the true history of the Giza Plateau, is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling. Egypt, undoubtedly one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, 
or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens. The first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder. A curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts, encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. The arrival of the last of King Tut's chariots at the Gem, which stands for the Grand Egyptian Museum late last month, was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the Citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional method you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact. But scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. And there is something in you always. We found out today in my talk, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA. How Tutankhamun died, no one murdered him. My excavation in the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now, important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Amun, maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the West Valley of the kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamun exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Their new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule, will be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018, and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep III. The ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive, just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru. These re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn, leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent, that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. 
Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work and, as such, are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide, and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong, evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopean's work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization. Each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three, and although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the Trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are Cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world, polygonal masonry has been found, such as Aksum in Ethiopia, where the toppled obelisk is said by some to be in excess of 1,000 tons, I have never, and now strongly feel will never, find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths, as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door. A mysterious rock-carved feature also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths which we should all be focusing on instead. Such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time, where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology, which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity. Facts and Truths Exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling.